Joining me now is Dr. Walter Dorn, chemical weapons expert and professor at, of defense studies rather at Canadian Forces College. Thank you for being here. Glad to be with you. We're going to lean on you for some of your insight and your knowledge on, on what it is that we're discussing here when it comes to the use of, or alleged use anyway, of chemical weapons. I mm -hmm. know that as a scientist you've done extensive research in physical chemistry specifically, so enlighten us as to what exactly we think we're dealing with here. Well, it's pretty obvious that there was a chemical attack. Um, and it could have involved both chemical weapons and riot control agents. Riot control agents would be like tear gas. So it could be a complex uh, chemical cocktail that was used that uh, gives a variety of symptoms. But we're seeing symptoms that are, that are consistent with the classical use of nerve gas. And we know that Syria has two different types of nerve gas. One is SAR and the other is VX. And um, the images are just heart-wrenching and it's, um, you know, seeing people who are asphyxiated, seeing them, uh, kids lined up dead uh, from, look like the positions they were in when they were sleeping. Uh, it's, it's, it's horrible stuff and um, this would be the worst use in 25 years. It was said that apparently the women, the men, women and children died while they were sleeping. Would they have, while they were inhaling this, would they have felt anything? Some of them would have, yeah. If, if they were sensitive or if they were just moving around, they would uh, start coughing and then uh, the foam would come in the mouth and it would, it's a very ugly death. Um, but if it's a very high dose and it somehow seeped in, like uh, some of the um, possible explanations are that, that there were children who were, had gone down into shelters underground and this is heavier than air type of agent. So if it descended in, in great concentration, it could get people unaware. But in general, they would, they would start feeling the symptoms immediately and, and move out in desperation. So you, you couldn't even potentially protect yourself if this was being pushed into the air surrounding you? Uh, yeah, you? I mean, such a low concentration can, can kill you. So you, um, for instance, VX, it just take a drop on your skin to kill you. Wow. How widespread is this type of weapon? You mentioned Syria. Obviously, we knew that Syria has this sort mm -hmm. of arsenal elsewhere. Uh, during the Cold War, it was very widespread. The superpowers stockpiled 20 to 30,000 tons each of chemical weapons. But in 1993, the Chemical Weapons Treaty was signed, and that created a, a comprehensive ban on chemical weapons, the production, stockpiling, use of chemical weapons. And so the superpowers have been disarming themselves, have been destroying their stockpiles. Um, and Russia and, China and, um, and the United States have very little left of their original stockpile. So there's only six countries that didn't sign that treaty, and Syria is one of them. So um, there are very few outliers. By and large, there's been tremendous progress in creating a, a prohibition against right. chemical weapons use and against the actual uh, possession of chemical weapons. So what about eliminating its existence altogether? Yeah, um, I mean, it's possible to officially eliminate it, but people could do this uh, in little laboratories. You just need a fume hood and some of the chemicals are very easy to make. You take precursors that are used for ballpoint pins and you can make some nerve agents. So it's very, um, it's possible that, that, that uh, non-governmental groups could make it or the governments could make it in secret. But the issue is whether it would be militarily significant. Can they produce it in big quantities? And then of course, when, as soon as you make chemical weapons or use them, you need to have the protective mechanisms to protect your own troops uh, from the chemical weapons themselves. So it's, it's a fairly complicated in, in the application of chemical weapons. And we saw in the Tokyo subway bombing in 1995 mm -hmm. that um, it, even though there was a hope that the, the, the Aum Shinrikyo had of killing hundreds, they only got 11 people. And that was because it, the agent didn't, didn't disperse properly. It didn't, it didn't vaporize. Um, and so um, there, are, there are difficulties in, in the dissemination of chemical weapons, even though the production of the actual agents themselves isn't that difficult. That's concerning in and of itself. I have to ask you, I know that you've been an advisor to the United Nations on peacekeeping. In what capacity has this discussion come up? Well, the United Nations this is uh, front and center now because uh, the UN team is actually in Damascus at, at that time, just 10 miles away from where these attacks happen. Now that took months and months of negotiation and they were only allowed to visit three sites in Syria. So now the Syrian government will, will be a test of them. Will they allow the inspectors to do some uh, samples, take the air and uh, surface samples and blood samples? And that will uh, show whether the regime is, is open to actually real investigations. Or if they stonewall like they have for months and not allow the UN inspectors in, then it'll be an indication that, 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 that they're responsible and they have something to hide. 
Dr. Walter Dorn, chemical weapons expert and chair of security and international affairs at Canadian Forces College. Thank you. Thank Very you. insightful. Absolutely.